probably tell by my, by my accent, I am originally from Spain. Uh, I started working for SMA uh, back there. In 2012, I was relocated to Australia because they needed an expert on my field, which uh, back then was the technical design of off-grid systems and self-supplied uh, renewable energy-based power systems. Uh, obviously, a lot has happened since. Uh, now I see myself uh, dedicated to the execution and development of large-scale PV projects in Australia. Uh, I lead a team of project managers and together we uh, do our best to deploy as much PV as we can in, uh, in the large scale, uh, well, in the Australian market, which is my focus 100% uh, at present. And uh, we just make sure that the systems are well designed, they make sense, they are delivered on time and they work as expected or as intended, uh, which might sound simple, but it can get really, really complicated. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, jump into it. I thought, or well, uh, discussing it with Andrew, uh, we thought it would be worth explaining to you who SMA are and what we do. So, oops. So, uh, there we go. So this is a bit of the, well, rough agenda uh, that I've prepared. So it's a five uh, very specific points, uh, starting with uh, well, SMA, which is uh, what I do. Um, again, you will see logos uh, from SMA and so on. I, it's not my intention to promote anything here. It's not a commercial presentation. It's just that some of the graphic material is really good and, <laughs> and I've used it. But mm, yeah, it's not my intention to promote anything or, or to you know, sell you any product here. So uh, SMA, this is actually the, the headquarters. Uh, my manager, uh, this is in Germany. My manager's office is actually right above where the light is on. That's where my, my boss sits right now. Uh, probably, well, not right now because it's Sunday, but that's where he works. Uh, well, this is the, the, a photo of the factory rendered with a very fancy image. But the, I guess the main idea is SMA was founded in 1981. Uh, it was founded by three university students who are represented with these three silhouettes here and one professor of them who, well, invested 50,000 euros and now owns 51% of SMA, pretty much. <laughs> so that was, that was a good investment wherever they, they are. But yeah, these four PhD students, uh, they were well, studying power systems and power electronics and decided to start a company manufacturing control and monitoring equipment for large scale wind farms. Uh, that humble beginnings developed in what we know SMA uh, to be today. It is headquartered in, in Kassel in Germany. Kassel, if you're curious, is pretty much in the geographical center of, of Germany. Uh, and we are by far the global leader in the PV inverter technology in the, in the world. We have uh, a very, very high, look, I am very focused on the large scale. In large scale, we are not counting China, well above 50% of market share. Once you put China into the equation, because they seem to have their own market, uh, not only in solar, but in many other industries, uh, I wouldn't dare to say a number. So I'd rather not say it. Uh, well, we actually invented the first uh, PV string inverter in the world. It was a patent from, from SMA, long expired, because it was in 1991, and these things are for, I think it was a 10-year patent. But solar inverters, as we know now, as we uh, now know them, uh, were invented by SMA. Uh, we have a hundred percent focus on solar PV and storage at uh, at present. Uh, that's well, there has been some changes on that, but presently it's a hundred percent focus on uh, yeah solar PV and inverters for storage. So we don't uh, produce panels. Uh, we don't produce uh, batteries we produce uh, inverters, which is uh, 
the piece of electronics that converts energy coming out of, of a so, out of a solar panel into actual grid compliant usable power. Uh, it is the smart of the system and we will, well, I guess go into a bit more detail uh, later in the presentation. We have uh, over 75 gigawatts of installed base inverter globally. Uh, funny enough, the national electricity market in Australia, which is the biggest network in Australia, uh, I also have a few slides explaining what the national electricity market is, has a peak demand of 35 gigawatts uh, in its history. So we produce more than or we have an installed base of inverter that can potentially deliver more than twice the peak power consumption of Australia, uh, which is a, is a big thing. Uh, I provide a claim uh, or a, a source here for this claim because I understand it's a, it's a big claim to make. Uh, it comes from the Australian Energy Regulator. Uh, this is uh, well available for all of you to check out. You will see across the presentation, there are lots of links and sources uh, for, for all the claims and, and, and information that I'm putting out here. So feel free to go ahead and, and dig a bit deeper on any of those issues if they pique your, uh, your curiosity. All right, so we are now represented in 21 countries. Uh, this is the ones painted blue are the ones where we have offices. Uh, the ones painted red are the ones where we have production facilities. So everything we produce is produced in Germany. Uh, it's produced to the higher, highest standards of quality and sustainability. We operate the biggest factory, the biggest carbon neutral factory in the world. Uh, we don't produce any CO2 emissions in any of our production uh, at this stage, which is something, uh, well, uh, we pride ourselves on, I guess. Uh, well, currently one in five inverters that are installed in Australia are from SMA. This is counting on all the residential, commercial, and all the uh, segments. So a bit of experience there. Uh, this is what uh, we are locally. So SMA Australia was established in 2007. Uh, we, we are based in North Sydney, uh, or that's the headquarters of SMA Australia. We also have an office in Brisbane and another one in Melbourne. Uh, we used to have an office in Perth, but the, <laughs> our rep in Perth uh, quit recently. So we are in the process of establishing a new one. Uh, we will very soon have an office in Perth uh, as well. We have 75 employees directly employed by SMA. Uh, obviously we have a number of service partners and externals, but those are SMA employees in Australia. Uh, we support all industry segments in the PV uh, in the PV sector, and we have an installed capacity of over five uh, gigawatts uh, currently, which is, uh, is a lot of power. I guess this is just uh, I've, I've included a couple of links here, uh, just in case you want to dig a bit deeper onto how an inverter is made. Uh, we have uh, well how we assemble circuit boards and. Uh, video which I think it's it's uh, it's very interesting, which is called the world in a lab. Uh, we have laboratories which are accredited uh, for well any uh, IEC, which is the electrical uh, the International Electrotechnic Commission, and the UL, which is the equivalent in the US. So we can certify any electronic product in our own labs, and that's a very interesting video to to see. It's a really state of the art facility. Uh, the photo you see in the middle is actually the factory. Uh, that's where we produce all of our inverters. And the other two photos are inside the inside of that same building. So, Okay, so enough, enough of, of SMA. A lot more than most people know is available on the public domain. Uh, Australia is a great market like that. We have a few industry bodies which are very, very transparent and put out all the data you would uh, yeah you would want to see and and probably more uh, it just my experience is that uh, most people don't know about it and it's a shame because it's really good quality information that uh, allows for very well informed uh, decisions and, and uh, well 
understand an understanding of the power or the energy industry, not only renewable but all of it. Uh, so it's it's worth uh, knowing and making use of those resources certainly. All right, so we will see what uh, well PV cells and inverters are. I will be brief. I don't want this to be too technical or to you know become an engineering kind of of uh, uh, of speech, but a, but a common level of understanding I think it's good. So. Uh, a PV cell is uh, pretty much silicon. Uh, silicon is about 73 to 75% of the earth is, is some sort of silicate. So silicon is a direct derivative of that. It is a form of refined silicate. Uh, normally, uh, the silicon used industrially it is uh, melted sand from a lot of it comes from the Sahara Desert. Uh, it's also used from Gobi or uh, Atacama. Uh, more countries are jumping into this, uh, well, the, the production of this resource, which has become a, a commodity. Uh, most semiconductors and modern electronics are some sort of derivative of molten sand desert sand and solar panels are nothing but that. Actually, uh, the first solar panels which were uh, produced for the aerospace industry were the leftovers of electronics. Uh, silicon that was not pure enough to produce high-tech electronics was diverted to the production of solar panels. Uh, that was back in the 60s and 70s. Obviously, we've come a long way since and now uh, production of silicon is purposely made for solar panels and the prices have gone have come down incredibly like it's been a very very steep decline on, on prices which is good um, I guess yeah without uh, going digging too deep into it it is uh, about a PN junction so we take that silicon and we dope part of it with phosphorus and another part of it with boron those are all very common and clean materials that uh, have barely any, any environmental impact. Uh, the phosphorus, what it does, it, it adds an electron to the outer layer of the silicon atom, uh, which is represented on the, on the picture as well. Uh, so silicon atoms have 14 electrons in their equi equilibrium state. Uh, and reaching them with phosphorus adds one electron to the outer layer, which, mean, which means they have 15 electrons. The ones that are doped with boron have one less electron. And the natural state of things uh, tries to keep balance. So nature is a very balanced system, right? We all know that if you leave things to their own devices, they will end up in a perfectly balanced uh, system. So because there is this discrepancy, uh, we use light. Uh, light is, well, mostly formed by these uh, subatomic particles called photons, right? When photons coming from any source, we use the sun because it's free and it shines every day and it's very, very intense, but you could use any source of light. Uh, when these photons hit the solar cell, an electron is liberated. Uh, sometimes, not, not all the time as it's represented in this uh, uh, in this diagram, but when this electron is liberated, uh, it cannot uh, it cannot join an atom in the same material because all of those atoms have too much or too many electrons. So the only way it can recombine with any other atom is by going to the other layer. Uh, what we do is we put a circuit in the middle that the electron has to go through, and we use that electron. Uh, as electricity, because electricity is nothing more than the movement of electrons in a medium, in a material. Uh, so a material which we call conductive, we normally use copper, but also aluminum is a very good conductor, and most metals are, uh, are materials which are conducive to the transfer of these electrons. So it's a lost electron that has nowhere to go, and it's just finding an atom that needs it. It's looking for love, poor thing. So we force it to go through a circuit because we're very cunning. 
and we've learned how to do that until it finds an atom that wants it and it can rejoin that atom. And while it's going through that circuit, we make it work for us. Uh, if we think about it, nobody needs electricity. Nobody uses electricity. What we need is temperature, we need light, we need movement, we need all sorts of things, but who uses electricity in its raw form? Only very odd industrial processes, but in our daily lives, we flick a switch because we need light, or we use the blender because we, what we want is the movement, or we use a heater because we want to heat up an environment, right? Or we want a fridge, which we don't want the electricity, we want the effects of this electricity. The only reason we use electricity is because it's very convenient to uh, transport and generate, and it converts into any other form of energy in a very efficient manner. And that's the only reason electrical power is, is used. Uh, imagine trying to transfer something like motion or temperature over long distances, that would be impossible. So we just use electricity instead. And then we convert it again into whatever we need it to do. So that's, uh, I guess, a, a solar cell. <laughs> it just uh, transfer, or in a, in a nutshell, I guess, converts light into movement of electrons. That's what it does. Okay, so now inverters. So inverters have a myriad of, of functions, but the most important ones are three. Uh, they convert power. So the power coming out of a solar cell is what we call direct, is what we call direct current, it's uh, DC. So, uh, the voltage level is stable and all the electrons flow in the same direction. What you use out of the power socket in your house or well, the standard form of electrical power that we use is AC, is alternating current. So the electrons are moving uh, in both directions very quickly, 50 times per second in, in Australia. But the inverter does that. So it converts this direct current into actually grid compliant usable AC power. It also optimizes power. So uh, the array or the, the solar cell and the, and the solar panels are very passive elements. So they are hit by light, they produce a certain amount of energy, but they have no way of controlling that energy. They have no idea what's needed on the other end or how that energy can be optimized. That is a task of the inverter to do. And uh, another of the main functions of an inverter is to ensure stability and quality of supply. So obviously uh, maintaining a power grid is a very delicate balance. Uh, energy generation has to be perfectly matched with energy consumption. If there, if there is no match, the system collapses and we all have a blackout. So when you have uh, blackouts, which are not as common nowadays, but they used to be very common not that long ago, and especially in places where the grid is a bit weaker because they are not urbanized or because they are far away from points of generation, uh, those blackouts are a lot more frequent. And those blackouts are generated, or are, most of them are created by an unbalance. So there is either more consumption than generation or more generation than consumption. And then the whole system collapses, loses balance, and and switches off. That is, or that was the case in the South Australian blackout of early 2019, uh, which made the news and was very, very famous. They blamed all sorts of renewable energies, which was a complete fake uh, blame. But the thing was that the consumption on the network was a lot higher than the generation. So the network could not deliver as much power as it was required and the network went out of balance and switched off. And that's exactly what happened. And that's the cause of 85 to 90% of blackouts you, you will experience. Uh, so in, inverters are there to protect the network against that. Uh, I guess, look, really, that was a whole lot of information, most of it very technical and, and kind of complex. The, Bottom line here, the idea is that a system, a PV system is a system that you put a panel facing the sun 
and you get usable power at the other end through black magic there. It's, it's certainly not black magic. It's, it's a lot of science and, and, and engineering. But what, you know, as a non-professional or non-engineer, what the most important thing to understand is that you put a panel in the sun and you get usable power on the other end. And there is no waste on this process other than a little bit of temperature. Uh, but that's what a solar system does, converts light into, into electricity. You know, there is one, I think, uh, which goes a bit deeper into the, um, well, physics of, of the question. That it is actually a good question, though. It, it, it says, well, why, when you have the phosphorus dop doped layer, uh, when the electron is displaced from there, how does it recombine with this material? And, and I think if, yeah, sorry, I just didn't want to dwell too much or spend too much time. But the thing is when the photon, I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen now, uh, but when a photon uh, impacts the panel, it releases an electron. So the electron goes through the circuit, here is represented by a light bulb, and it comes back to the material where it is doped with boron, which means it lacks electrons. It wants more electrons. And, and that's why it goes from the part of the system that has too many electrons to the part of the system that has too few. Then because that process happens constantly, there is a moment in which you end up with a lot of electrons on the bottom, la on the bottom layer and they have nowhere to go. So they go back, to back up and the whole system uh, starts again. So the impact of light on that surface is what kicks that process started. And it's a constant process that just goes around. And yeah, for as long as light shines on that panel, uh, there will, the, the system becomes unbalanced and then it tends to balance itself by transferring electrons. And it, the movement of electrons is a, uh, is a consequence of that material trying to keep itself in an equilibrium state. Okay, I guess I hope that answers the question. Uh, okay, we will, uh, Wolf, I see your question. It's a very, very good question as well. Uh, we will go there when we touch on large-scale solar systems. Uh, I think it will be a lot more relevant to, to do it that way. Uh, yeah, when you talk about power being wasted, uh, well, wasted is, I, I guess it's a, it's a word to use. I wouldn't use wasted because really you only use the energy that you need. If you don't need it, you just don't use it. It is true that a smarter system could use it for something else when there is an excess of generation. That's what's called a smart grid, and that's a whole topic unto itself. Uh, but yeah, the truth is the system has to be capable of producing more power than it is consumed because you can always throttle back the system. But if suddenly a factory starts running and there is a whole lot of consumption coming into the network, you need to have that reserve of power that you can ramp up really quickly and uh, deliver that demand. So uh, power being wasted is kind of the way uh, the network is kept itself in balance. Uh, when you go into smart systems, what we do in, on a residential level, for example, we have control equipment that can turn on your heater, uh, the hot water, or any other element that consumes power, but it's time independent. But doing that at a network scale, it's something that the Australian network is not yet ready to do. There are projects, uh, there are initiatives which are looking very promising, but at the moment it's just not being used. Uh, it's being reduced in output. And yeah, you have the potential to produce more energy, but you don't produce it to make sure the grid uh, stays stable. So. Wasted, I guess, is a word you could you could use. And as per how this is regulated, we will, we will go into that uh, a bit later. Okay, so 
Oops. There we go. So this is a very short video, which I think can explain what a solar system is. It, it's 60 seconds and it explains what it would take me probably 10. So we'll try and play it. If there is any problems, well, we can move on. And because you will all get a copy of this presentation, you can all uh, go to the link and, and watch the video. Uh, but let's see. How solar power works. The Smiths have a house. And they want to be less dependent on rising energy prices. But most of all, they want to do something good for the environment. Therefore, they decided to install a PV power system made of solar panels and an inverter. Both components are critically important for successful harvesting of solar energy. Thus, it forms a strong contrast to the solar thermal system, which looks similar, but is used widely in homes to heat water. The solar panels capture sunlight and convert it into solar DC power. The solar DC power passes through the inverter and is converted into alternating current. Alternating current is the current coming out of your wall outlet. The electrical energy, which is not fed into the power distribution grid, the Smiths use for themselves. For their contribution, the Smiths are compensated in return. Now, not only the Smiths profit from the clean energy from the sun at a reasonable price, but also the environment. All right, there we go. So this is uh, just a short video. There is a whole website which is called SMA Sunny where there are hundreds of those explaining different concepts. Uh, I think it would be uh, probably beneficial to have a peek and you may find something interesting there. Uh, but I think it's a very well explained, uh, you know, in very simple terms, what a, what a solar system is uh, in the residential space. Okay, so, oh, here it is. So this is a snapshot of the residential PV industry in Australia, uh, a very, very uh, kind of condensed way of showing it. On the well, right hand side, you see this graphic. This is pretty much the anatomy of your power bill. This is what you're paying for. Uh, about 7% is the environmental costs of maintaining those, those power assets. Uh, the real cost is a lot higher, as you know, especially in a coal dominated industry like, like Australia is. But this is what's being paid with your power bill. 44% uh, is maintaining poles and wires. Uh, so the uh, transmission infrastructure and distribution. 10% uh, is the electricity company costs. This is marketing, this is operations, administration, so just the on ongoing costs of the, of the company. And 39% are the costs of generating that, uh, that electricity. And this is pretty much what any Australian power bill is, is composed of. So we have uh, Australia is a very, uh, like it's a country that has adopted residential PV a lot. Like there is a lot of residential solar in Australia. About 21% of households, this is over 2 million households in Australia, have a rooftop PV system uh, of different sizes. But uh, it is, well, it is a lot of houses. Those PV systems have a combined capacity uh, which slightly exceeds 10 gigawatts. It's a lot of power, uh, a lot of power. So just to put it into, into I guess, uh, perspective, the peak consumption of New South Wales is about 18. Uh, that is in terms of power, it's not energy. So there is a complicated conversion there. But in terms of peak power, it is a lot, a lot of it. So that delivers about 5.5% of the Australia's energy demand. Uh, or well, it's capable of delivering that if uh, people use them correctly. Uh, some of them are not used correctly, unfortunately. But uh, it's, a, it's great that they are there and it's a matter of, of I think, better educating the, the general public uh, beyond 
a simple marketing message, which is what uh, is out there most of the time. Uh, so currently, uh, PV, solar PV is the cheapest form of electricity available to any Australian, uh, household or industrial or whatever scale. Solar PV is by far the cheaper, the cheapest. Uh, this has been, uh, well, it's now very well documented. There are a lot of independent financial entities and, and research institutes that uh, back up that claim. So uh, it is by far the, the cheapest form of electricity. Uh, well, and residential PV in Australia, despite those high numbers, is on the rise. It's, it's rising at an accelerated rate. Uh, we've hit record historical figures in late 2019 and even early 2020. So despite the COVID-19 crisis, is still a very, very active industry in Australia, which, uh, well, it's surprising. Uh, and the best of all, it still has the potential to increase by 15-fold, uh, which is a huge potential. And there is, uh, yeah, a couple of sources here which go into detail. The uh, CEFC, uh, report goes into a lot of detail on how this works technically and economically. Uh, this is the first of, of the sources. Uh, so Clean Energy uh, Finance Commission is, the, is what CEFC stands for. And those guys do really, really good work at putting dollar figures behind all of these, uh, well, clean energy information or, or potential. All right. So... So moving on, this is the uh, well, rate of adoption, I guess, of uh, residential PV. So as you can see, Queensland, South Australia are leading the way in terms of number of dwellings with uh, PV on the roofs. Uh, Western Australia is following them closely and uh, New South Wales could do a lot better. But despite which it's not bad, like New South Wales is that slightly over 20% of dwellings have PV on the roofs, which is a significant number. Uh, it's looking good. Uh, this is the Australian PV Institute's uh, data, which uh, again shows this data in a whole lot of different formats. And you have the link at the bottom of this page. But I think that gives you a very good snapshot on where uh, different states are, are sitting in terms of residential uh, PV. Okay, so getting a bit of <laughs> in the you know cold hard uh, data, I guess, or, or figures. Uh, so, well, is it profitable? Really, is it a feasible thing for a household to do? Uh, well, you can see that the Australian Energy Council uh, has put together this uh, this graphic where it shows the payback time or the payback period in years on a rooftop PV system for the well, average residents in the in the capital city. Unfortunately, they've done it only in capital cities, but it's quite uh, usable or transferable to any other Australian household. Uh, you can see Sydney uh, that, well, a well-designed system can be paid off in about three years uh, currently. The graphics, well, as, as you can read here, uh, they consider the, not only the power which is not consumed from the grid, but the revenue from the compensation. All states and territories have some sort of what we call a feed-in tariff, which is the FIT uh, here. A uh, feed-in tariff is a compensation for the energy that you put back into the grid because, well, you may not be consuming at the time of it being generated. Uh, so it is, it is a very realistic analysis. Again, it comes from a very trustworthy source, which is the Australian Energy Council. Uh, it's a government dependent body. Uh, the, well, what the data clearly shows is that currently in Australia, uh, five kilowatt seems to be the sweet spot for a residential PV. Uh, if you go to a smaller system, it's obviously cheaper, but it takes longer to pay itself off because it generates less energy. So the optimum point in terms of payback period is a five kilowatt system. That's what the data uh, indicates. Uh, truth is because, well, it is a hot topic. It's under debate, uh, you know, states and territories and governments 
are changing the policies and changing the revenue or the uh, compensation schemes and the tariffs, it's very difficult to predict in long term what's going to happen. We don't know what decisions are going to be made, but that is when we need well, a critical mass of citizens pushing on the same direction to make sure the decisions that are made are in favor of renewable energies and, and uh, yeah, keeping the climate under control. So this is kind of the economics of it uh, in the residential space. Okay, my field is actually the, the power network, the power grid and the big scale of uh, renewable energies. So let's have a look at well, what the Australian power infrastructure looks like. Uh, this is the Australian transmission lines. Uh, you can see they are color coded according to the voltage level. Uh, this is all extracted from RME, which is Australian Renewable Energy Mapping Infrastructure. It is a, uh, it is a project of uh, the, I'll say it, uh, ARENA, which is the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. And it is a great resource. It maps out whatever you tell it to. Uh, there is a link here in the the first link in this uh, in the bottom of this slide leads you directly there so you can play around with it you can map any infrastructure uh, or power related infrastructure in australia you can yeah map out generation uh, transmission well distribution well uh, substations gas pipelines oil pipelines mining any sort of infrastructure is mapped out uh, or is overlaid in the in this map of Australia. I think it's a really, really good resource, uh, which certainly worth uh, using. So as you can see here, uh, Australia is quite unique. Uh, well, particularly for me, I, coming from Europe, uh, used to tiny overpopulated countries, Australia is a whole different uh, reality for me. So it took me a while to adapt to this. And one of the things that really surprised me is that Australia is not interconnected. Uh, Australia has four main networks, as you can see clearly here. The most, the biggest one by far, which is the East Coast, uh, which you can see there is a line connecting the whole thing. Then you have Darwin, which is a tiny little system uh, that only supplies Darwin. There is Western Australia around Perth, uh, which also, well, goes as far as Kalgoorlie, but not much farther than that. And then there is another one, uh, another system around in the Pilbara, around Broome, and that is uh, because of the mining uh, sector. But those are the four main systems in Australia. Uh, what we operate in mostly is what we call the NEM. The NEM is the National Electricity Market, and that spans Queensland, New South Wales, ACT, Victoria, South Australia, and Tasmania. Because you can see between mainland and Tasmania, there is this dotted line which is a 400,000 volt uh, line, which actually goes under the water and connects mainland with, uh, with the little island in the south. And that way, well, we can trade energy with, uh, uh, with Tasmania and the systems can help one another to, to, to stay on balance. Uh, uh, ACT for the purpose of the NEM or the operation of the NEM is considered New South Wales. So when you find information on the, on the NEM, you'll never see ACT because it's embedded into New South Wales uh, as far as power goes. So the NEM is regulated, so it's legislated by uh, the Australian Energy Regulator, which is AER, and it is operated by the Australian Energy Market Operator, which is AIMO, the almighty AIMO. For us in the industry, those, those guys are, are the big boys. Uh, which are well operating this market. So it incorporates about 40,000 kilometers of transmission lines, which is a very long cable. We have to keep in mind that this has a cost of about currently, uh, yeah, $600,000 per kilometer or so, uh, which is big asset. <laughs> it is a very expensive asset. And uh, yeah, it's, it's there to serve uh, the people. So it's, it's a great thing. 
Uh, it supplies about 9 million customers, which uh, is a very odd number uh, in terms of, well, it's a very long line for a very small number of customers. Uh, being used to the numbers I used to see back in Europe, that is a very small number of customers for 40,000 kilometers of lines. Uh, but hey, such is, uh, such is the market in this part of the world. And, uh, you know, some transmission lines are as long as 150 to 200 kilometers, and they are supplying 2,000 customers or so. That's especially true in North Queensland, where some lines are extremely long and there is only a thousand houses at the end of the line. So it is uh, the reality of it. Uh, so the NEM represents 80% of the electricity consumed in Australia, uh, which for all intents and purposes, we can call it pretty much all of it. Uh, it currently has a peak generation capacity, which is just below 50 gigawatts. And as we saw, a peak consumption of about 35. So there is a good buffer there to make sure the grid is, uh, is op operable, but uh, it needs more capacity uh, because at times, well, that puts the network at risk in stability wise in some, in some areas of, of the network. Okay, so we see that the wholesale price for electricity uh, has fluctuated from minus $20 per megawatt hour up to $300 per megawatt hour in the last two days. That's on the 15th and 16th of this month. So the day before yesterday and yesterday, uh, we've had a price fluctuation that goes between negative $20, which means generators are paying the network to inject power, uh, up to $300, which means generators are being paid to generate power. That is... Uh, Oh, I had a, a question here. It says, is AIMO a government body? AIMO is an independent body, uh, body uh, which uh, was set for the purpose of, uh, of operating the market. It has the government endorsement and obviously operates under the Ministry of uh, Industry, Resources, Energy, and all, uh, well, they changed the name with the Scott Morrison government when they scrapped the, uh, the, Minister of, the Ministry of Science and the embedded in, but it depends on the ministry, but it's an independent body. Uh, the energy, the Australian energy regulator, which are the ones writing the rules, are a government body, government dependent body. This is a screenshot I took yesterday from AIMO, from the market operator. Uh, you can see this is for New South Wales, and normally Queensland has an excess of generation uh, so prices tend to go negative on weekends where consumption is lower and the generation capacity is higher. Uh, at the time when I took this screenshot, which was yesterday at 6 p.m., uh, the energy had a price of $71, $71.7 per megawatt hour. And there was a demand of 9.1 uh, gigawatts at that point in, uh, in New South Wales. So this is the New South Wales uh, price. Uh, this is accessible, this is publicly available. You can see in real time what is the consumption, what is the generation, and what is the spot price of the energy as we call it. So the way energy is traded in Australia by the Australian market operator, of course, uh, is, uh, well, the NEM or the national electricity market is like the, stock, like the stock market. It facilitates the trading of electricity between generators and retailers. Retailers are the people you pay your power bill to. Those are the, the retailers. So they buy this energy in bulk from the generators and they resell it to the public. Uh, and this works well under the standard offer and demand laws that regulate most free markets. So generators bid. They say, I have, a, well, let me, let, me, let me take a step back. This market works in a five minute interval. So every day or the, the world for these people is segmented in five minute intervals. So the generators place a bid saying in the next five minutes, I will be capable of delivering that much power. Uh, AIMO, the, the market operator, takes all of those bits and adds them together. 
and looks at the consumption. The consumption, obviously there are metering points that are measuring how much consumption is there. And the, I, the market operator puts that packet of energy and says, this is the energy that is available for the next five minute period. The retailers then say, my customers need so much energy. So I need to buy that much energy to be able to sell it to my customers. Uh, that energy then, according to the offer and demand, a price is established, which is the price that the retailers are willing to pay according to how much energy is available on the network. And that's the price that gets fixed for the next five minutes. And that happens every five minutes, uh, forever, 24. We can see, well, some utility scale, uh, PV, and other bits and pieces that uh, I think are, are important. So uh, here we can see, uh, well, project size and cost. These are all projects uh, of more than 20 megawatts outputs so of large scale. Uh, they're really large. And we can see all, all of these dots, which uh, yeah become a bit of a cluster, but we can see a tendency of systems getting bigger and cheaper over time since 2017. If we aggregate all of this data or we take, take mean values from all of these points, we end up with this, which is a lot clearer and shows the tendency. So the red is 2017. We can see a very high price in a very small system. When we aggregate all of this data, 2018, we see a big leap on system size and a big reduction on price. Uh, and then we can see how every year the systems tend to be bigger and the prices are significantly reduced. This is because of two things. Of course, uh, there is the economies of scale. So for us suppliers, producing more means we can produce cheaper, so we can sell cheaper. And it's also gaining experience on how to set up a system in the most efficient possible way from developers, from EPCs, and from the industry as a whole. Uh, so these are the numbers currently, uh, how they look like in, in Australia. So you can see the trend is uh, going directly downwards in price, which is a really good thing. Okay, so here we see what the costs are or what, yeah, what are the costs of deploying large scale solar infrastructure in, in Australia? Uh, I guess the bottom line or the only, the main thing to explain in this slide is that things like the connection and development costs, uh, as well as balancing of system, which is the BOS, uh, haven't changed much. Uh, if you look at the inverter, which is the green area, it's uh, about half of what it was in 2017. So it means we are selling for half the price that we used to sell in 2017. And that's across all manufacturers. And tracking systems remain the same. EPC uh, costs are slightly lower, but not by a lot. And modules have also experienced, uh, they've halved pretty much. So most of the cost of the cost reduction is being borne by us. Uh, inverter manufacturers and panel manufacturers. That's where the big cost development has happened uh, in the industry. Okay, so here we have a, a snapshot looking at profitability, right? Uh, I really like this map. Uh, it's from Bloomberg, New Energy Finance, which is obviously an independent finance consultant. And they've mapped out the world and they've shown what form of energy is the cheapest in each country. Uh, you can see that Australia is pale yellow, uh, which means that, uh, well, utility PV with a tracking system, which is a system that orients the panels to the sun, is the cheapest form of energy currently available in Australia. Uh, you can see a few Southeast Asian countries are still coal is a bit cheaper. Uh, seems to be the case in Indonesia and in Vietnam, in Thailand, uh, in Japan as well. But you can see China and India is PV with no tracking. And well, this is the, how the world is looking like. The promising message for us is that in Australia already, the cheapest form of energy available is, uh, is PV, large scale PV. So that's really good, attracting a lot of investment. Uh, currently the LCOE, which is, stands for Levelized Cost of Energy, 
uh, is, a, is a conversion we do to be able to compare different sources of energy in an apples to apples kind of comparison is, uh, is achieving you know, uh, values as low as 27 to $36 per megawatt hour. As we saw here, uh, you know, at that particular point in time, energy was going for $71 per, per megawatt hour. And the average in 2019 was $88, $88.5 per megawatt hour. So that's a big profit there. <laughs> that's a big profit margin. Uh, in 2020, the average spot price is $75 and a half dollars. Uh, that's because with the COVID-19, there has been less uh, power consumption because a lot of industry is not operating and office buildings are not uh, on. Uh, but it's still a pretty profit to be made there. Uh, that is why it is attracting so much investment. Uh, you know, advantages is, uh, well, obviously it's a very predictable cost. Uh, the system doesn't need fuel, it has no moving parts, it has no thermal loads, so there is very little to go wrong once the system is up and running. And the operating expenditure is less than 1% per annum uh, compared to the, the capital expenditure. So once you've deployed the system, energy is free for the lifetime of the system, which is around 25 years. That's why it's the cheapest. And obviously there is a third factor, which is like, well, you cannot accurately, you know, price the effects on climate change of using coal or, or, or fossil fuels. And so those are the main uh, factors. Uh, just as a note, the average price all of us are paying for energy is about $270 per megawatt hour. So you can see who's taking the cut here. Certainly not the generator. <laughs> <laughs> the guys making the money are the, as usual, the middlemen. But yeah, all of this information is available from uh, from the sources which are mentioned. So go dig deeper if you if you want. Uh, here is uh, well large scale PV systems per uh, state and territory. Uh, this well here on the right hand side you have the uh, criteria I've used to, well, to put this data together. Obviously, those are projects in Australia, projects bigger than 10 megawatts, which have reached either financial closure or are under construction or operational. Nothing that is on the prospects, on the books or future plans. It's everything is solid and tangible. Uh, the number of projects that I have used is 91 because that's the number of projects in those, uh, with those statuses in, in Australia. Uh, well, the idea, you get the idea. In terms of big projects, uh, New South Wales is on the lead at the moment, by far. Uh, the blue part of the line is the SMA uh, share of each of those markets. So the green one uh, is Schneider, who dropped off the market. So they no longer exist in the PV section. So they obviously Schneider is a big electrical component manufacturer, but they no longer are operating in the PV uh, industry. And then our biggest competitor, which is Inga Team, is a Spanish manufacturer, is the red uh, one. And the rest is very much, uh, yeah, uh, market dominated by, by SMA, which uh, is a bit of a testimony on the kind of quality of product, but also quality of support that we offer the market and our commitment to uh, delivering, uh, well, delivering solar systems, I guess. Okay, so moving on here, you have a bit of a, a market share per inverter manufacturer in New South Wales and ACT because obviously that's uh, considered the same place uh, as far as the name is concerned. As you can see, in New South Wales, we have a 55% market share in terms of capacity. And uh, yeah, you can see the number of projects which are operating at the moment is uh, by far the, the largest. Good, these are all the projects that there are in <laughs> New South Wales and the ACT uh, with the size, just for information. And this is the 
Well, this is from the Australian PV Institute, just to show a graphical representation on, on what's happening in the PV industry in Australia. So when I came here in 2012, it was a very modest, small industry. Uh, what has been happening since is just a, it has skyrocketed and it's still going upwards very, very strong. Uh, you can see the curve uh, over time. Uh, here is, uh, I guess, this is a, just a 10 second, uh, 10 or 15 second thing that shows the evolution of PV in Australia since 2007. So you can see how the industry started uh, kind of slow. That's about when I came to Australia and it accelerates at a, at a very, very high pace until today. This is all data from uh, the Australian PV Institute. But as you can see, it has had a very, very quick, uh, well, evolution recently, or in more recent years. All right, so how, what can we do? Or what's, uh, what's the future holding? Uh, which obviously very much depends on what Australia decides and uh, what we manage to uh, make our politicians, uh, you know, decide here. So currently, the renewable energy industry employs 28,000 people in Australia. Uh, investing in a clean future can create over 50,000 jobs on top of those 28. Uh, those, a lot of these jobs are going into, well, rural and regional Australia because that's where big solar systems are deployed, uh, which is, and they are very high quality employment, uh, you know, highly educated people with, uh, with uh, well, decent, decent jobs. Uh, over the last three years, we have seen over $20 billion uh, committed to large scale solar and wind energy projects in Australia. Uh, that's uh, that's private investment, so that's no that doesn't include any government subsidies or anything. That's purely private investment uh, coming into the economy in Australia. Uh, if we keep working towards Australia's renewable energy target, which is ambitious but very achievable, we will see about fifty billion dollars being injected into the economy uh, in the next few years very much depends on how quick we we want to achieve that target this is very achievable australia is in a very unique position now and we see investment from all over the world coming into australia uh, purely private investment a lot of very experienced international epcs are or and project developers and investors are coming to to australia uh, because it's, it's a very very profitable industry so uh, there is a a report that was published uh, recently, actually on the 5th of May, uh, by the Clean Energy Council and the uh, well, Financial Review, uh, which is a, well, a finance newspaper or a news site, uh, saying that, well, we can invest, or Australia is uniquely positioned to invest in a clean recovery from the COVID-19 crisis that has a, an immense potential. So Australia has now by making the right decisions, the potential to secure the lowest cost most and most reliable energy supply in the world. Uh, and it, this is a real prospect if the right decisions are made from our politicians, our beloved politicians. Uh, this obviously represents a unique opportunity to kind of revitalize the manufacturing industry in Australia because having the available, well, having access to the lowest cost energy in the world means that large scale manufacturing is possible again and becomes feasible. There is other things that are not directly renewable energy or not directly PV related. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of green steel, for example, uh, can also be done. Uh, green steel uh, is is a patent uh, by UNSW. I think it was done uh, in the in 2007 was invented, but no one kind of cared about it much. Uh, it is a process by which uh, you can manufacture steel using hydrogen instead of coal. Uh, so 
if you use renewable energies to power the system, uh, the only byproduct of that production is water. So you can create steel uh, having water as a waste, nothing else. And this is now very, very feasible. I've uh, placed, I mean, I've, I haven't done any slide on it because it's not kind of my topic, but I've put a couple of links to it. And there is a, a report by Professor Roscano that says that uh, that can offset and then sum the entire Australian coal industry. It has the potential of completely offsetting that and position Australia as a uh, well, leading, you know, in clean material production and clean raw material in, uh, in the world. So that has a very, very good uh, prospect. So I think we are at a critical time in which uh, the right decisions being made now will shape the future of Australia. And Australia can have a very, very bright uh, future in terms of uh, well, uh, CO2 emissions and, and yeah, moving towards an environmentally friendly uh, future. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I know I've gone way, way over time.